Okay, so hi, my name is Tristan Slominski. I'm Capability. I'm Tristan LS pretty much everywhere. And the uh, Capability is Capability IO everywhere, but there's nothing there yet. Um, and today I want to talk to you about delegation, which I continuously see is missing from the way we do authorizations in general. So in order to sort of set the stage, first I want to highlight something that we all take for granted that is kind of actually weird the way we do it in the physical world versus the way we do it online. Um, and as example, I wanna go through how to borrow a car from a friend. And it's as straightforward as you believe it is, which is you ask to borrow a car, you get the keys, and then you get in the car and you drive it away. So that's typically how we do things in the physical world. I want to highlight that this is quite different if you imagine how we do this in the online world. In the online world, this would look something along the lines of you ask to borrow a car, then you create an account in whatever service cars are in, then your friend through that service somehow shares the car with you, then in order to drive the car, you would log into the car, and then you would drive the car away. Um, it sounds sort of like a silly example, but this pattern arises everywhere online. And what I want to highlight is that it is not how we um, share things in the physical world. And now it becomes more complicated. So let's say I borrowed the car, I on a ski trip, and I broke my leg. Now I need to travel back, and I can no longer drive the car. So in the physical world, the solution remains straightforward. I find, I find another person to drive the car for me. I give them the car keys and then Dre drive the car. Now, how would that look in an online world? I would find another person to drive the car then they have to create an account with the car service, giving all their stuff. Then I have to still get in touch with the owner of the car in order to get them to share the car with this new person that they don't know. And then finally they share the car. Then this new driver now logs into their new account in the car service, and then now they're able to drive the car. So. We're so used to seeing this online, but this is actually a pretty weird pattern if you think about it, how we do things in the physical world. And in essence, this is an example of uh, what's, what's been called a service chaining problem. So um, the service chaining problem occurs as soon as there are three parties involved in some sort of authorization exchange. Um, so we'll go through an uh, example in, par in particular, more familiar to what we, we are used to dealing with. Um, so imagine there's you, there's your bank, and let's say Mint. What Mint does is, um, one of the things that it does is display financial information from your different banks. And so the way this works is what you do is when you wanna log into your own online bank, you, the way you do that interaction, you will provide your username and password. The bank then will, you know, will allow you access to their web portal and you interact with the bank. This is normal. Then if you want to interact with something like Mint, you repeat the process, you provide your username and password and you interact as normal. The service chaining problem now occurs when Mint wants to talk to your bank. Um, and because bank is expecting to talk to you and not to Mint, there's really, there's initially, there's no good ways of doing it. Um, and Mint in particular sort of just gives up and gives your username and password and says, I am the user and give me the stuff and I promise not to touch anything. This is, this is an anti-pattern. But um, it's not Mint's fault. So I'm not picking on Mint in particular. This is an example. Um, and it's actually, Mint isn't the one that can fix it. It's the bank. 
but here let's drive this problem even a little farther as to how how bad of a situation this is um, when 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 Thmint gained your username and password you know they validly need it in order to log into your bank and the only thing they want to use it for is to download and categorize your transaction information that's all they're going to do with it and i trust mint will do it right um, but your login username and passwords are definitely stored with mint and the claim is to save you the trouble of entering it or, or something similar now going farther down you grant into it the limited power of attorney when you do this and into it is not responsible for anything that goes bad basically so in essence you give into it all your credentials to your bank and they promise nothing bad will happen and i fully believe into it again not picking it into it and mint here i fully believe that's what they intend to do um, but we don't have to do this thing that way we say this is okay um, I believe this is madness, and Intuit probably doesn't care. So, um, so there is a reason for this, right? It's not it's not because it's bad and Intuit wants to do it. It's um, there is a reason why this problem arises. So let's kind of evaluate what the interactions are and what actually happens here. When you log into your bank, the bank, in essence, authenticates you. When you provide the username and password, authentication, that's straightforward. Another way to frame this question, however, is literally asking, who are you? When you log into Mint with your username and password, Mint also asks, who are you? So one way of viewing this interaction is, when you talk to the bank, who are you? When you talk to the Mint, who are you? So the problem arises when Mint attempts to talk to your bank, the only way they can um, authorize themselves is because the bank asks them the question of who are you? And this is the root of the problem. Um, a side note on Auth2, right? Because usernames and passwords are bad, Auth2 Auth just asks who are you harder. It goes through more steps, but in the end it comes up with who you are. Not on API keys, they're very much like passwords and they also ask who are you? Now, now that I've beaten that to death, um, an interesting question comes around, and this is less familiar, is why do we ask who are you? It seems obvious, but there's a very particular reason for this. And that reason is um, the access matrix. So what the access matrix is, is who can do what to which resource? So there are three, um, the three things in place, in play, who, um, what can be done and then resources can be done to. And so here is an example access matrix. Um, on the left side column, we have the who. We have Alice, Bob, Carl, and Denise. And th those are the who of the access matrix. Those are our principles that can take actions. Across the top row, we have invoice, memo, form, source code, and those are examples of resources. And then the reading glass and the pencil are your read and write permissions. So for example, Alice can read and write the memo. Denise can read and write source code. Straightforward um, access matrix. Now what you'll notice here is that there is a lot of empty columns in this access matrix. So what we tend to do is instead of stalling all, all the, this entire access matrix and having null values, et cetera, we tend to collapse this access matrix to remove all the empty spaces. When we collapse by columns, we get the common familiar concept of access control lists. And that is invoice. So what you see, by, what I mean by collapsing by columns is we distribute the information about who into every possible column and couple it with the permissions. So in this case, Bob can read the right invoice, Alice can read write the memo. This is the exact same representation. This is where the who question, who are you question actually comes from. So in order to determine and access decisions, we need to know who does what to what resource. When we collapse by columns and we generate access control lists, 
we have to know who it is. Back to the original access matrix, what we actually can do and provides an equivalent set of permissions and access controls is collapse these things by rows. And this is what our capabilities. So instead of distributing who can do what into each resource, we grab the resources, attach them to what can be done to them and distribute them to people. So as you notice, Alice can still read and write the memo, but the information now is organized differently. So capability is a combination of designating a resource and the, and the permission to do a particular thing to it. And this changes our question from who are you to what is authorized. So back to our service chaining problem where we ask who are you and we have the bank asking Mint who are you and therefore we have to provide our username and password. What if we change this question to what is authorized? And what, what the answer to that question can be a capability where you are able to read and only read the transaction data from the bank and do nothing else. Um, so how would that work from, from the very beginning? How does Mint come into possession of your capability? of your capabilities. So when you log into your bank, a capability amongst many others, but a capability to read your transactions is distributed to you at authentication time. So you still say, who are you? Because the bank needs to establish a um, relationship with a particular principle. But what goes back are capabilities, because we know at this moment you are who you are. Here are the capabilities that you can have. Then when you authenticate with Mint, once you establish a trusted connection with Mint, you can then grant, delegate to them the capability to read transactions. And at that, that point, when Mint wants to talk to your bank on your behalf, the only thing they can do is read the particular transactions from your account that the bank originally granted you. So the combination of you being able to give your capability to Mint and Mint um, giving that to your bank that is delegation, and that is a frustratingly missing piece from a lot of our authorization systems today. And it all comes from collapsing an access matrix in a different way. And we go to great lengths to solve this problem with access control lists. Um, so let me show you a quick demo of this delegation. Um, so What, I, what I'm going to have here is a small script. Um, and what this will illustrate is a uh, most naive and simplest implementation of capability, which is simply a function. One, one of the benefits of capability is that they have very function-like behavior. You can pass functions around, and those are, in essence, capabilities. And in JavaScript in particular, um, the reference to your function is unforgeable, which is a, which is a a good um, capability property. All right, let me talk with my head down. So um, for this example, um, we're going to have our bank, and we're going to have naive authentication mechanism. So this bank will have um, account where you at example.com, and this is your password, and your financials will be um, an, an account you will have account one with your transactions being you have you deposited ten dollars you withdrew one dollar added seven dollars etc the interesting part are the capabilities so the capabilities that come with this account um, what will create our capabilities to get your balance which in essence will um, just sum up all the transactions and give you the result um, capability to do a deposit which will push um, the deposit amount onto your transactions. The focus of the demo will be the passing around the transactions capability, and this in essence just returns a copy of the transactions in your account, and then withdraw capability. Um, the, log the bank will offer us a login authentication, so this will be a classic username and password setup. Um, and then we have a our third party provider Mint, and their account setup and financials are the same. Um, this is definitely not the bank password, 
that we're going to be using. And the MEMT capabilities are to add financials. Um, naming is hard. In essence, we go, this is what accepts transa read transaction capabilities and adds them to your MEMT account. And then um, it will offer a read capability, which will go through all your cap uh, read capabilities that you've added and display um, your account information from different banks. And there will be one bank in this particular. And then um, we all, MENT also provides a, an ability to log in. Um, so we're going to log into the bank. So, and for this demo, we're just going to instantiate the bank and MENT. And we're going to log in, and we're going to log in using a standard username and password setup. And so once we log in, what we get back are capabilities. And so here's our capability for account one. And as I explained before, we have our balance, deposit, transactions, and withdraw capability. I think I can do this one-handed. OK. Um, so the, the next step is we're going to, just to demonstrate that functionality works, we're going to read transactions from our uh, bank account. And so in essence, we're simply invoke the transactions capability, and that will return our transactions from our account as demonstrated. Um, next up, we're going to read the balance. The balance capability returns 89. And then we're going to deposit $17. So we're going to deposit $17. And we deposit was successful. We have transactions, and the balance has now been um, increased. Let me do this. Okay, everything's showing up, so that's good. Um, excuse me. So we're going to log into Mint, um, not with our bank password. So, and the Mint now gives us add financials and read capabilities as before. Um, we're going to demonstrate what read does and what that looks like. So without any capabilities, when we attempt to read, it, there's no accounts to look into. What we will now do is the delegation part. So we're going to use the capability to add financials. We're going to provide it a nickname that's meaningful to us, and we will pass the transactions capability. And now that it's successful, when we invoke read, Mint is able to read, um, use, a, use our capability, invoke it, and get the results back. So this simple functional model, and I'll show a more complicated demo later on, but the simple functional model demonstrates that capabilities are a lot like functions, and you can think of them like passing functions around, which is something we're all very familiar with. We're just not familiar of thinking authorizations in such a way. Okay, so that's the that's a service chaining problem and delegation. Now, now that we have these capabilities that we can pass around, um, we, run, we immediately run into a revocation problem. So part of the reason capabilities aren't as popular as access control lists is because we typically want to take away permissions. And revocation problem um, is difficult to solve, but not impossible. So we'll, we'll demonstrate um, solving revocation problem here. Now, the nature of the problem and why it's important and why we don't like it is that when I want Mint to stop having access to my bank transactions, I want to revoke the capability. I just say that capability is now invalid. But what ends up happening is I got a capability from the bank, I gave it to Mint, so it's the same exact capability that I have. And so when I revoke that capability, Mint has no access to the bank, but also that revokes my capability, and now I need to go get another capability from the bank. Um, and that is an inconvenient problem, and it's inconvenient enough that it's, it's a, it's, it drives down adoption of capabilities. The bank can then give us another capability, which is separate from the original one, and then we have resumed our ability to interact with the bank. Um, and let's do a short 
a functional demo of that. So for the revocation example, we have our familiar bank set up. Um, the capabilities will be a little more complicated here, so I'm using uh, creating all capabilities at the same time. Um, what I am essentially introducing is a one step of indirection so that I can revoke it and essentially nullify a var variable here. Um, but much the same as before we set up balance, we set up deposit transactions and withdraw, but we add additional ability to revoke a capability. And as you see, with our level of indirection, we can, we, we, in functional land, we simply delete it. And mint is uh, unchanged. Okay, so as before, we're going to log into the bank with our username and password. We get back our um, capabilities. We're going to log into Mint in a similar way. We have the previous capabilities to add and read. We will add our bank financials to Mint as we have before. Financials have been added. And now we'll read and there's our financials. So now the revocation problem is when we want to get rid of the capability, we will revoke it. And so we're revoking the transactions capability. And once that is successful, Mint can no longer read um, financials. But so when we attempted to do Mint read, it doesn't work. And the problem becomes is when we want to invoke our trans read our transactions, it also doesn't work. So there is a solution for this, and this is the membrane part of the capability in membrane solution. So what if when we log into our bank and we get a capability, the next solution to do is not to give Mint the exact capability. What we will create a membrane through which we can export our capability and it will generate a different capability that is essentially proxied through the one that we got from the bank. Um, this proxy mechanism can be set up in multiple ways, but in essence, we have a one-for-one -one proxy here. Then when we sign into Mint, we give them our capability. Mint is now able to use the capability to read transactions from the bank. And we are still using our original capability to talk to the bank. When we want to revoke, the way membranes work is we would revoke an entire membrane and then any capability that was exported through it will be automatically revoked and the entire tree of capabilities will be revoked. So what membrane gives you is that revocation membrane. And now Mint can no longer talk to the bank, but uh, you can. So here's a simpler demo of this. Um, so the way the bank is set up is much the same way. And we're going back to our simple implementation. We don't need any level of indirection in our bank. Um, it, it will return the original functions of bank balance deposit transactions and withdrawal. Ment is unchanged this entire time. And we add a new construct of a membrane. Um, so this is one way of doing this type of uh, setup uh, directly in JavaScript. In essence, we create a new map, but this is our proxy. And um, what a membrane offers are two capabilities. When we create a new membrane, we get a capability to revoke it, which will destroy everything that's exported through the membrane. And then we can also get a capability to export another capability. And the way, we, the way we set that up is in essence, we create, in this particular instance, we create a, a function that will invoke the original capability and then we enter it, set it as a proxy and in the, index it by the capability that we get. So uh, logging into the bank, we get our capabilities. Logging to Mint, we get our capabilities. Now let's create a membrane. In this particular, instance we create a new membrane 
and we get our export and revoke capabilities. The way we export our transactions, the one thing about what you're seeing is a very boring pattern of capabilities, which is to do anything, you use a capability, right? So in the way we interact with membranes to manage capabilities, we use an export capability on the membrane. So much like as previously, we used the capability to give transactions to Mint, and we use the export capability to export this particular transactions capability. And what we get back is an export, exported transactions capability. Now, this is what we take and give to Mint. So instead of when we, we still use the Ad Financials capability, we still give it the same nickname. But in this case, we give our exported capability. And we can read financials in Mint, and the capability works. And the way we revoke the membrane, as I mentioned, is we invoke the membrane revoke capability. And now we should not be able to read our financials in Mint. And in fact, we are unable to, and we can still retain the ability to read our transactions. Okay, so those demos were set up in particular to sort of show the functional, um, the functional nature of capabilities. But um, you know, writing functions around Node.js, you know, Node while it's interesting, it doesn't offer anything of what I demonstrated about services talking to each other. Um, so what I want to demo to you is uh, next is. Um, how I've implemented these capabilities and how they can be used um, out, out in the real world. So what I'll, what I'll walk you through is two Lambda services, um, Lambda functions behind capability interface and demonstrate the same kind of delegation mechanism where we can use. Uh, so one of the more difficult things to do in Lambda is chain lambda functions, lambda functions together by passing authority across them. And so what I'll demonstrate is passing a capability as the authority to be able to do a thing. So um, for this particular example, um, we're gonna set up two services. So what we end up happening is we're gonna have a first, we're gonna have a name service. And all it's going to do is for every request it gets, it's going to reply, reply with this body, status goes to 100 and body Austin Node.js. So ahead of time, I've exported some capabilities. So this is, uh, this is the capability format that, uh, that I represent capabilities as, is a URI. Instead of HTTPS, we have a capability. This is the authority section, and this is an authority token, excuse me, capability token. And the way to translate that into, the way to translate that into a request Um, is calling the membrane Amazon US East one capability IO endpoint and passing the capability as a bearer token in the authorization header. And what you'll see is this is the response status from that Lambda function that I've just co called. So what's nice about that is it's, if you're familiar with Amazon and S3, and S3 has pre-signed URLs, um, so what this demonstrates is a pre-signed URL pretty much for every possible Amazon action that you can take in form of a capability. 
this particular one is uh, invoke a lambda function. So that's the name service. And then this is the welcome service. Um, and in the end, what it's going to do is grab whatever the name returns and fill in the welcome part, right? So um, it's a little more complicated than the name service because it didn't, it depends on what data gets posted, but in essence, when we get an event, we're going to parse the capability out of that event. Um, this code then, as I've done in curl in the command line, will use the authority and pass the capability token in a, as a better token and authorization header. And we're going to invoke that capability. Um, so, We'll, we'll do a request and we either resolve or reject the promise. And once we have the name that we want, then we will return 200 with our welcome here. So just like for the name service, I pre-exported the capability for the welcome service. So you'll be able to see me invoking the welcome service and passing it a capability to the name service and observe the result. And so what you can see is the composition of authority now demonstrated in AWS Lambda, where I gave one Lambda capability to invoke another one. It can't do anything else. I didn't have to mess with permission. The story behind capabilities here is that ownership implies authorization. Um, now, you don't have to believe me that that, that actually works. Um, I'm, I can demonstrate to you that it does. So I have a gist here. Um, any name in particular? Somebody say a word. Hello. Okay. We'll do hello. And so now we have a URI here for that particular um, contents. So instead of Austin Node.js, it'll be welcome hello. Uh, what I'm using here is a command line tool for capability IO, but in essence what it does is we're going to export through a membrane the access to this particular URI, and this is my export capability. What we got back is a capability to invoke that particular URI. And as you can see, it returns the contents. And so naturally, when I pass this to the welcome service, so when I, when I pass this capability to the welcome service, it will say, welcome, hello.
and there we go. So it's as simple as straightforward to start chaining lambda functions together. Okay, so, so it works in just in a simple machine in JavaScript, and there's actually projects where they use capabilities to provide um, security for JavaScript execution, um, like SES, Dr. Dr. SES, Dr. Seuss, play on words, is a one such project. Um, and we also have capabilities that we can do across uh, the internet amongst any services. Um, here's some example patterns to leave you with um, to sort of show you how capabilities are useful more in, than in just this demo context. So uh, one way, this is more familiar example, which is passwordless login. More and more companies do this now. But Im imagine there's you, a password, excuse me, passwordless service and an email service of some sort. Instead of giving them a username and password, you're saying, this is me, um, by providing your email. And what the service will then do is email your capability to log in to that service via one-time link. If you're familiar with Slack, the magic link is, in a sense, an example of a capability. But you've been using capabilities way longer than that, which is any email reset link that you've ever gotten is a capability to reset your password. Um, passwordless login is just using that flow every single time. When, and what and what ends up being what ends up happening, excuse me, is that the, in essence the passwordless service delegates the burden of author, authorization of who you are to the email service. So if you're a startup or somebody else, like you might have better authorization than like Google email does, Gmail, right? But you probably don't. And so you could delegate the authorization headaches to Gmail or somebody else that deals with it more and hand back the capabilities to log into the service. Once I open up a link in an email, I'm logged into the password service. Um, another example pattern is protecting personally identifiable information. Um, so in, for example, with GDPR, there's a lot more information to protect. Um, Imagine there's you and the email sending service. As soon as you get somebody's email, you can generate a unique identifier for that email that's divorced from the email field. And you can invoke a capability to create email in the email sending service. And from then on, what they'll do is they will securely store that email according to whatever regulations are necessary. And what they'll pass you back is a capability to send the email. So you can't read what the email is, you can't access the PII, the only thing that you get back is the ability to send an email to that original address. And that will be safe for you to store. Still have to store it, store it securely, but it's much less, much less stringent requirement than actually having an email access. And then when you want to send an email out, you use, invoke the capability to send the email and the email service responsible for the PII actually deliver sends the email on its way to the particular email address. Um, and this pattern has been used in credit card processes a lot, where you give them the credit card information and then it's just blocked away from you. So that's also a capability pattern that all you have, all you get back is a unique identifier or a way to invoke a capability to charge something, but you never actually see the credit card information ever again. And because what you've seen is in a membrane as a service pattern, and this really enables delegation um, to happen quite in, in a quite decentralized way from the actual service. So for example, there's you, there's a membrane service, and there's your capability aware service, and let's say there's Denise, and you want to delegate some authority to Denise. Um, you create a membrane in the membrane service, you get back an export and revoke capabilities, you have that. And then you export your capability through the membrane, you get back a new capability. So in this case, we only read our flight information because we're traveling and we want them to be able to track our travel. And we grant that capability to Denise and then Denise can use our capability to retrieve our travel information. Now, what's worth highlighting here is that Denise is not aware, not aware of capability service and the travel service here, doesn't have an account, 
that didn't know it even existed until they they got a capability from you, which can be in form of a URI that you click on. So that is a, that is one benefit, and what you get here is you are in charge of delegating your permissions as opposed to the service. And more importantly, um, administrators or developers in the service do not have to imagine every possible role or permutation of how you would want to delegate your, per your permissions because each particular membrane and whatever you export through it is a bundle of capabilities that you manage together. Um, so those are the, some three patterns and there are many more. Um, here are a few references. I've been doing this for many years, so references are few. Um, and credit where credit is due. I'm not an artist. This was a great place to get icons. Um, what are your questions? Yes, sir. All right, so the question is, how, how, how does like a, something like membrane service know that you rejected a capability to another service? Um, the membrane service that I've demonstrated is a proxy, so it's like an API gateway, so it stands between every request. So when a rejection happens, um, it's, it's within that particular service, so all the, all the capabilities are revoked, so any next request that is proxied will be denied. Does the each does each service maintain list of capabilities that have been authorized? No. Um, what? Well, it depends how you want to implement it, right? So, if if you want to keep the membrane with the service, then yes. Um, everything that every because in essence, instead of control, instead of having an access control list, you now have capability list. So whenever the, the capability shows up, you know that it accesses part, it represents a particular permission for a particular resource. That data has to, they, 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 excuse me, that data has to be stored somewhere. Um, so, so yes, if you want the membranes with the service, the service essentially maintains that. If you have a central membrane service, that membrane service can handle maintaining it. And what remains on the service to verify is that the call is coming from the membrane service, for example. Um, and the membrane service can be either like a separate standalone service, which is what I've shown, but it can be, um, we're more and more becoming more comfortable with service meshes. And in essence, the membrane service can also sit inside your service mesh. Right? So instead of asking the who you are question, it can be asking the uh, what are you authorized question as a sidecar in a service mesh. Right, right, so I'm just repeating what you're saying with the mic. So what you're saying is membrane service, when I get a call, I call out to the membrane service to verify that the capability is valid, which is way one. The other way is I maintain the list, and I, so if I revoke something, I know the cap then I do a lookup where the capability is valid or not. Uh, one way you didn't list is uh, the one I mentioned, which is the membrane can serve as an API gateway of sorts, and so the call, and this is the, my preferred way, is so that when the call shows up, you know it's authorized. If it's not authorized, you never get the call. Um, and so it simplifies service development because authorization is uh, pushed back towards the membrane service. What, instead of authorizing every single membrane, um, you, what you saw is when I exported a capability, it exported to hit a particular URI. This is very much like any proxy configurations. They're just much more dynamic and fine grained. And so the URI, UX, so if I have a service and I want to 
offer you a read capability, I would, I would export a URI to my service. And you can also add other things. So I would put a header or a secret. Um, there are two signatures supported to verify that the request is coming from the membrane service. So the trust is pushed around. And in essence, what you end up doing is trusting the membrane service, but then you, what you asking, who are you? But you, what you're asking is, who are you to the membrane service? And then, the mem and then you trust the membrane service, the membrane service gives you, makes a call, and you implicitly trust that because it came from the membrane service. Um, yeah, but there is multiple ways of, of, of setting it up. What's, um, and you can do keep just raw capabilities, um, but the membranes allow you to bundle those things together and revoke them together. They're sort of, uh, they're not exactly the same, but with um, usernames and passwords, we have role-based access control, and that puts sanity on our access, right? Where who you are and you get a role, and that gives you a set of permission. Membranes are kind of a dual of that, is that they group capabilities together. So if I wanna give you permissions, I would, I would assemble capabilities, export them. I would create a membrane just for you. I would export all the capabilities through that and then give you the capabilities. So then when I know I don't have relationship with you anymore, or I don't want you to have access, then I just revoke your membrane. So a membrane can stand for an account, for an account. A membrane can start for a resource. A membrane can start for a file. It's very ambiguous what a membrane can stand for. Um, for sure, like there's uh, so they, they they already sort of exist. Um, I remember uh, that would be helpful. Yes, um, like I I propose that capability all right. There are also the the current state is there are everybody who does this comes up with their own standard, including me. Um, so. But there are some working groups attempting to come up with a particular standard. But right now, it's, it's in the early days and no standardization on what's going on. Right. It's you. Yes. But even if you write your own, I would encourage you to separate out the membrane service from your other services because you're repeating that same pattern over and over again. Um, so whatever trust area you have, it, it's, it would still benefit to be separate. Yes, sir. Right. Right. So, so the question is: Is there any protection if I delegate your capability, then you can delegate it to somebody else, and that passes on? And I heard two pieces. One is when it's actually invoked, you get all these steps of lookups, and then the other part of that question was: And how do I know who has access to what? Right. Um, so the I'll do the easy version first, which is the multiple hops, um, it's possible to design a service to um, have just one hop always, no matter how many delegations through membranes are. Um, so like the membrane service I've demoed is, it has a guarantee that everything is just one hop always, no matter how many times you delegate through how many membranes. So you can delegate, you can create 100 membranes and then export each one through. That last one will go as fast as the first one. Um, right, so, so you don't give them the original, like, so if, 
when I create a membrane for you and I export a capability, I give you the exported one, and then you would create a new membrane and you'd grab yours and export it elsewhere, that information stays in the membrane service. Um, and, and the way that works in particular is each one of these, those capability tokens are actually an encryption key to store that configuration data. So the service can't read it unless you actually hand it a capability and then the service will decrypt it on your behalf. If you're exporting it to somebody else, we'll use that configuration for the new membrane, and, but encrypt it with that newly token that you have, right? So I have, so I have a key to the same proxy configuration, and then you have a separate key to the same proxy configuration, and, and so on down the line. So that information gets re-encrypted every time with a new capability, and the service doesn't have that information. Um, that would be, bad. Um, so it, it's, only, it's only in plain text when you get a request, decrypts it, makes a request, proxies your request, and then throws away the keys again. Yes, sir. Yeah, so overlaps between OAuth2 and JWT tokens. Yeah. Right, the JWT is the revocation and re-exporting part. So like one, it always has to go through the centralized service. So that would be the distinction here. So with JWT, I go to the service and it gives me a token. And so this is the revocation problem. I can either give you that token and then you have an access, but if I wanna revoke it, then one, there's not clear way of revoking it. You have to time out things. And so the revocation story isn't as clean as if you have a proxy where we can cut access through. Um, and then I cannot independently delegate it to somebody else. Like I kind of have to go through the service. Um, so the idea behind membranes is that they are separate from your service and enable delegation without ever consulting the original service. Kind of going back to that car key model where it's like, I don't want to go through DMV to give, you my car, to give you my car keys, I just give you my car keys, and then you can give it to somebody else, and they can give it to somebody else. Um, with the OAuth2 model, um, same, what OAuth2 does is asks who you are through the party that you're delegating through, right? So you, you still get that token. So, I log, so if Mint implemented OAuth, right, I would be logging into Mint, and they would present me, log into your bank, and then there would be a back dance. But in essence, I am authenticating who I am to my bank, and then the bank delegates the token to Mint. And then I go into my bank in order to control and or deny access to that token. Um, so I, there's, I can't, so even if I grant Mint access that, like Mint, Mint can grab the token and delegate it, but now Mint has the revocation problem in that okay, they can definitely grab the bearer token and hand it to some other third party, et cetera, but that's like sharing password all over again. They don't have really a mechanism to generate new token without deleting their own token and hand that down, and so on and so forth. And each one of them still needs to talk to the bank, which is, in this case, the central authority for, authority for tokens being delegated. And there is, um, so that sort of centralizes that part in the bank. Which, is, which might be desirable for a bank, but for a lot of things that, that we do, um, decentralized delegation of things um, would be probably fine. Um, that's the contrast. Yes, sir.
That is a big question. Can you break it, break it down to pieces? Because I can't repeat it. So there was a third party contractor. Tell me the story again. Right, so the owner, so only the owner can share. So we're talking about for the mic. We're talking about GitHub. An example is where only a owner of the repository can share the repository. So the subcontractor now is being replaced with another subcontractor, and the solution is to share the account. Um, oh, okay. is, is that, does that characterize it? Um, so w what you've seen, so it's, but I, I, so I'm, I'm trying to understand the question to make sure I represent and respond to the right thing. Um, so we have an owner of a GitHub account, and we have a subcontractor that's using it, and now and we're going to get a new subcontractor, and they just get the credentials. Um, that seems like changing the credentials would be good, I guess. But uh, wait, the, let me s speak about the pattern of doing subcontractors. So if I have permissions, and I'm not the owner of account, um, let's tear it up to, so it's like, the GitHub account owner, and there's like a repository, and that's like a little hierarchy of account has control over repositories. So a way to control repository is the account owner would create a membrane for me. So the account owner, the root, has all the capabilities for everything, and everything starts from the root. So if they want to delegate an account to me, they would create a membrane, and they would export, uh, they would create a new resource, which would be a GitHub repository. And then that resource comes with permissions, right? And so each one of those is a capability, and the root account has a way to has a capability to enumerate all your permissions, okay. etc. When I come on board, uh, it's going they pretty good. I'm just a membrane trying to and they export it. capabilities for that account at whatever level Sounds of like I have more testing right? to do. So uh -huh. Write, commit, etc. And then um, that bundle of capabilities, and now I am essentially the admin of that account. Um, if I have a subcontractor, I don't need to talk to them. Um, this, is the, this is the decentralized delegation piece. It's whatever I find appropriate to delegate, I delegate. And so I would create a membrane, a subcontractor. You can only do pushes, sorry, pulls, right, and, and pull requests, and I delegate those capabilities. The chain keeps um, kind of also call back to earlier question, the chain of delegation is maintained. So you can always see that subcontractor uses using a child of a capability that you gave to me. And then you can resolve that problem in the human context of like, what are you doing with my car? Well, you know, why did you let that? And, we, and those conflicts are better resolved human to human or through legal frameworks than through authorizations like that. But we maintain, so it's not that you're trusting me with everything, all the permissions you give me, because in, in reality, nothing is there to stop me to give my username and password to somebody else. Um, so it, it attempts to make that simpler. Yes, sir. My. Right. My, my guess would be is uh, because everything is path dependent, so we've done access control list for so long, then that is the solution to implement. Um, that, 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 that's, I, I don't know why people are not familiar with capabilities. Um, there were, uh, I mean, from, from my research, there, there have been, when, when they first came about around the same time access control list, it was more expensive. Like, Computers weren't what they are now. Memory wasn't what it was now. And maintaining capabilities and keeping all this provenance and all the chains, um, I think that was more expensive at the time. It was easier to maintain access control lists. Um, but that's just my guess. 
Um, right. Um, file descriptors are capabilities to things inside Linux. So they're not named that Linux capabilities are not actually capabilities, they're enumerated permissions, right? But if you have a file descriptor in Linux, that it designates what you can do to a particular resource. For example, like the read-only file descriptor, you can read that file and you can pass that around. Um, that's a capability. So there exists, they're just, there's just not, we, we just haven't used like a authorization model where we recognize, no, this is a capability. Access control is just one um, because of historical path that we took, I think. Yes, sir. Okay, so, so what I'm hearing is like, what is, is there a more robust framework around security that you expect to have to address, for example, an audit trail of who delegates to what and monitoring? Um, that depends how you implement the, um, the membranes, right? So if you, um, if you have a membrane service, then that service can definitely audit, uh, leave an audit trail for every action that takes place. Um, depending on the needs, um, very much like we do certificate, uh, um, we issue uh, TLS certificates, right? We have certificate trust where every certificate issue ends up in that audit log. Um, that is straightforward. It's just, it's keeping a specific part, part of the log. Um, so membrane service um, could do that. If you're implementing, if you're implementing anywhere, it's, it's, it's adding an audit event. Um, so that's definitely possible. Yeah, and then you ask, like, is there a framework to do this? How, how can people get started? Um, I built a membrane service, so talk to me about your use case, and I'm happy to help and do whatever I can to, uh, to address the use case that you have in mind. Um, there aren't many other frameworks like this um, that I'm familiar with. There's one we talked about where um, uh, the closest I've seen is a, this is API gateway um, where they translate JWT tokens into opaque tokens and do a similar proxy thing where a opaque JWT token comes in and it's changed into another token. Um, so, um, Things to, you know, one, talk to me about memory service and I'll give you whatever information you need, but also like API gateways where they do, op API gateways, opaque token proxy would be keywords to look for, for um, seeing if there's anything else out there. And, and yes, sir. <laughs> Um, so our capability is being digi digitally signed to prevent against attack. So uh, when the so let's get, so I can talk more about what what capabilities are. So cap capabilities are the model of a capability is an unforgeable combination of designation and an action. So what you saw is I can write to a memo, right? That 
designates a memo and the action is right. And what capability is unforgeable. Um, unforgeable means that you can literally not create a fake one. Unforgeability works, uh, for example, in the JavaScript example, when I created a JavaScript function. In JavaScript runtime, if you're writing JavaScript, you cannot forge a pointer to that function, right? Either somebody grants it to you, or you have no access, you cannot call a function that somebody doesn't give to you. That's an example of unforgeability. Um, there are three realms to consider. Um, so that would be the memory realm. In essence, if you have a memory safe language, like where you cannot forge references to objects, um, then you can have a capability. Um, and, and that memory safety alone will guarantee you unforgeability. Now when we, as soon as we need to go over the network, we need to serialize the capability somehow. And this is, uh, we, this is where we trade unforgeability for unguessability. So what you saw, really long tokens are in essence uh, 64 bytes of random number. And for you to forge that capability, you'd have to guess a particular 64 byte sequence. Um, if that's not enough, then it can be 128 bytes, etc. But um, the way this is implemented um, with the capability one specification, it's an unforgeable number, unguessable number, in essence. So you can forge it, but it's unlikely. It's like a really real long URI, just like, and talk about crypto guarantees, um, it's much more straightforward to create an unguessable number um, because that's just as hard to guess as if a crypto signed capability. It's still a particular sequence of bits, right? So, and actually a crypto signed capability might actually have a smaller um, space of what's possible. But, in a, but that's, the, that's, that's the guarantee around capability. You, in essence, saying it's unguessable. Um, so any unique link, it just, and the, more, the longer it is, the less likely it is to be guessed. The other benefit of capability is because they're so particular, then if it becomes compromised, your surface is limited. Versus if you compromise your credentials of as you, then you gain access to all the things. Then of course, capabilities come with different permissions. If you, if you compromise a capability that queries for all the capabilities, then that's bad. That's worse than capability to read a particular object. Can you sign your capability to his? Can you sign a capability of his private key? His public key. But, well, you can, but in essence, that is separate from the key. Like, you're at that point. Uh, like this particular service is, is when you, the capability URI is that bit string. Like if you're, if you're doing any, all, only thing it does is resolve the configuration to proxy to. If over that data channel you want to do encryption and other things, then that's, that's orthogonal, that's separate from the, this particular thing. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you.